guys, it's Gabby, and today I'm going to be reviewing A Court of Mist and Fury by Sarah J. Mass. I'm very excited to get into all my thoughts and feels for this book, so let's get started. There really isn't much non-spoiler that I can say about A Court of Mist and Fury because it is the second book in a series, so what I can give you is the typical spiel, which is basically like I just said, that A Court of Mist and Fury is the second book in A Court of Thorns and Roses series and takes place three months after all the events that happened in the first book. And if you are unfamiliar with this series, I have a review for the first book that I will link down below, but basically it follows this girl Feyre who has to care for her two older siblings who are both uh, girls, so she has two older sisters that she has to care for, as well as her father. And so she's out in the woods hunting one day and she ends up killing this Fae and she then has to serve out a life sentence in Fae territory in order to make up for that Fae life that she's responsible for taking. And so uh, throughout A Court of Thorns and Roses you get to see Feyre's journey into Fae territory and um, sort of what it means for her living in this place that a lot of humans have never been into. And uh, it has a Beauty and the Beast retelling vibe uh, that's really um, absent. In the second book we're kind of like fading away from those ideals, but it's definitely there in the first book. So if you're into Beauty and the Beast, definitely re recommend checking the series out. But this second book just takes the whole world and makes it bigger and better than it was before. You get to see a lot more of the original characters and you get to see new characters. So the world, like I said, is just bigger and better and it's more expanded and it's grown a lot more. And obviously this book is a lot thicker than the first book. So you're getting to see a lot more development and descriptions of characters and details. And it's just a really, really well written book. And another thing that you may have heard about this book is obviously that it is very, very hyped. You've probably seen it all over booktube and this book was also on the New York Times bestseller list for five weeks in a row, I believe at number one. So that is just absolutely crazy, but this book deserves every single ounce of hype that it gets because it is so, so, so deserved. It's really well written, it's absolutely fantastic, and if you have not read it yet, I have no idea what you're doing because this book is so worth your read. It's clearly a five star out of five star book. And I'm going to get into some spoilers for it now. So if you have not read A Court of Mist and Fury, I definitely recommend picking it up. I will have links down below as to where to get a copy of this book as well as where to get a copy of the first book and just everything that you need to know about this whole world that Sarah J. Mass has written. So if you're interested, definitely make sure you click those links down below. But I'm going to get into some spoilers now. So if you have not read A Court of Mist and Fury, I would leave. I'm going to say goodbye to non-spoiler people and I hope you enjoy the book. So getting into some spoilers now, I'm going to start at this point where we have both halves of the book, the first half from the Summer Court and then the second half from the Bitch Queens of the Mortal Realm. And so we have both halves of the book, Amory has translated them, and what we found out is that uh, we are not supposed to combine both halves of this book. So we go to the cauldron and we're trying to nullify it in order to stop this whole war from going down. And basically we're nullifying this cauldron to keep the peace and stop Jurian from being resurrected and basically just stopping chaos from ensuing. And so Feyre is the one that is in charge of nullifying the cauldron. She's given both halves of the book and she does the one thing that she was not supposed to do, which is combine both halves of the book. So she does that and I could not have just been more frustrated because every single time a character does something that they are told not to do, 10 pages after they were told not to do it, chaos always ensues. So the chaos here in this case is that Jurian is resurrected, he's come back to life and he's here to make our lives miserable. So he comes and he takes everybody, he puts them before the King of Highburn, they have this huge cauldron and at this point I'm just thinking you want to know what? like. We're going to figure out some way to get out of this and then we'll see where this story goes in book three. What I was not expecting is for Tamlin and Lucian to walk in and be like, we side with the King of Hybern. Fuck you, Rysand. Farah, you're coming with us. And I just, like, I was so just, I, like, if I thought I was frustrated before, I was angry now. And I wanted to throw this book, like, across the room because that just really really irritated me because from the end of this book and I talked about this when I did my review for the first book I was totally team Tamlin and I could not forgive Rysan for what he did and I was just done with him and so by the end of this book now just my feelings have flipped 180 degrees and I'm so mad because I really wanted to like Tamlin and he's just not a good character He's not good at all. 
he just is a jerk and I'll get more into my thoughts on ships and relationships and things like that um, after I talk about this whole ending but that just made me really really mad and then we have Lucian who's just sitting here and letting all of this happen and he's not like doing a single thing about it and he's just like willing to just do whatever and he just pisses me off because you always gotta have the sidekick that's gonna support like the misled character no matter what and that was just so irritating to read because that just should not have happened. He should have stood up for Feyre. He was going to do it. And then it just never happened because he was just willing to stand by uh, Tamlin and be his bitch. And just that irritated me. Now that has happened, we're all here and shit's pretty much going down. And I, you know, I really at this point was like, things can't get any worse than they already are. And then here comes Nesta and Elaine and we're going to throw them into the cauldron and make them immortal. And they're most likely going to die. So I thought both of them we're going to die. Elaine goes in first, she lives, and then I was like, okay, well Nesta's gonna die. Then Nesta goes in fighting, and she comes out alive. So both of them live, and they're both fey and immortal now. And I can't even imagine what her father is gonna think, and if we're gonna see their reactions in this third book, but that, that just, that was such a hard point reading that in this book, because like I said, I thought both of them were going to die, and I was so, so scared for them. But Nesta goes down fighting, and she, like, gives the King of Hybern the finger as she goes down, which I just applaud so much, because Nesta's character, I really didn't like her a lot in the first book, but she definitely has grown on me throughout the second book. Her going down fighting, and then apparently that makes her different than the other Fae in some way, um, and how she was made, which I think was interesting, but I'm excited to see where that goes in the third book. So we have even more of the unexpected, because... Like I said, just shit is thrown at you at this very ending, and so now we're finding out that Elaine and Lucian are mates. Like, what is this? What is this? I was like, I, I couldn't, I can't. like, not only now are Rysand and Feyre mates, which, like, that's great. I'm totally down with that, but Elaine and Lucian? Like, that just, that doesn't hit home to me, considering that Elaine was willing to marry somebody that hates Faes, that is a Fae hater, and gave her an iron ring. Like, I just, I, so I have no idea where that's going to go, or how that is going to happen, but I'm interested to see where that plot line goes, because that, that just, nobody could have seen that coming. So I'm thinking that we're done. Like, each and every single time one of these things happens, I'm like, okay, we're done now. We're, we're gonna get some resolve here. And nope, the final thing happens, which is the worst of all things, which is that Feyre and Rysan's bond is broken at Tamlin's request because he does not want Feyre to be anywhere near Rysan because he think, has this just personal vendetta against him. And... So their bond gets split, and at this point, everyone in America is crying, and them and their mothers, like, everybody's just sobbing, because this possibly cannot happen and have a book three, because there's no way that their bond could be broken and we'd be like, we're gonna have a third book. And I was like, I couldn't, I couldn't handle or process at this point, because so much shit had been thrown in my face, and I just, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Farah goes off with Tamlin and Lucian, and then... Rysan goes off with his inner circle, and then I believe Nesta and Elaine. Don't quote me on that, but I definitely know that he is with his inner circle. And so I'm like thinking, you know, it's the end of the world. And then we get to Rysan's chapter, which is like he only has one chapter at the end of this book. And basically what you find out is that Farah and Rysan's bond is no longer broken, that like she played into this game to make uh, Tamlin think that their bond is actually broken. But it is not. Um... They still have their bond, they're still able to talk and communicate with each other, and all is good. But the big, big, like, moment of this is that Farah has, like, another tattoo on her arm, and she is the first lady of the Night Court. Boom! Boom! And I'm very interested to see where the story goes, but there's a lot of shit that's thrown at you at the ending that I just could not process. Things I want to talk about now, I'm away from... Uh, from that ending or aside from that ending. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is some of these sex scenes because they are very, very, very descriptive. But they're very well written, which is one of the things I think is really great. That's one of the things that's fantastic about it is that it is so descriptive and so well written that 
to the point where it's like you don't feel as awkward about it because it is so well written. But the one thing that I have to say about this is that I can't imagine being in Sarah's position where it's like I've written all of this down and now here millions of people are going to read it. I would be so mortified and so embarrassed but she just like takes it and owns it and I think that is the coolest thing and just so badass and I so have so much respect for her for that because I could never write anything that she writes like that and let anybody ever read it because I would just crawl in a ball and I would die. So the fact that she wrote those scenes and was able to make them uh, and able to kind of show them to all of us and be so open and so cool about that is something I really, really respect. So now getting into some of these ships that I wanted to talk about more. I really have no idea where it's going because I feel like that's just what happens in Sarah J Mass books is you read them and you just have no idea where it's going. You just you read and then you ship whoever you ship but it's constantly changing. So book one I was totally Feyre and Tamlin for life. Nothing was ever going to change that and now we're here at book two and I'm like Feyre and Rysan forever and Tamlin's a little jerk. Like Tamlin is just a possessive little motherfucker and I cannot stand him. Like I loved him and I wanted to root for him so much and just that ending really just pissed me off and I, I hate him and he's gonna get what he deserves. That's one of the things I'm really excited for is seeing him get what he deserves because this is what always happens is the character that is misguided always ends up turning to evil and evil says like oh yeah I'm gonna give you everything that you want and more and then he ends up and then the misled person always ends up getting screwed over by the evil person as well as the other person that you're, they're asking for or holding against their will so I think it's gonna be interesting to get Tamlin get fucked over I think it's gonna be very very interesting to read and I'm very excited to see that happen but, but Rysian's character himself is someone that I want to focus on because his character you I feel like a lot of people they were team Rysian by the end of the first book but that just couldn't happen for me because I could not forgive him for making this bond and just I thought there was something dark and creepy about him and I didn't like it. Do You get to see so much growth from his character and that's one of the things that I really love and really appreciate about this book is that you get to see a lot of growth from him and you get to learn a lot more about him and his backstory and how he knew that Pharaoh was his mate since like he saw her and that just broke my heart because you would not have even seen that coming if you were to read the first book like that he knew that and had that intention from like the very beginning and like how he just like had dreams about her and just all of this like his whole backstory she like makes him a hateable hateable character to being like the character that you solely solely root for and just the amount of like 180s that happen here in this book is just so mind-blowing so that's pretty much it for my review of according miss and fury i'm very sorry if this was a bit of a feely mess but i gotta say that this book has a lot of just amazingness to it and i'm very excited to see where the third book goes and yeah, so thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you next time for a new video. Goodbye.